other employees. She also handles interlibrary loan and manages a library journal subscriptions. Colette is a certified archivist and an active member in the Society of American Archivists and the Society of Ohio Archivists. She holds an MA in history with an emphasis on public history and a BA in history with emphasis on Eastern European history from Wright State University. Era Tansy is an archivist, researcher, and consultant based in her hometown of Cincinnati, the Ohio River watershed. She is a founder of the of Memory, Memory Rising, which provides research, consulting, and archival services with expertise in climate change, environmental and labor movements, and the Ohio Valley regional history. Memory Rising's clients have included Metro, the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Network, the Digital Preservation Coalition, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. She previously worked as an archivist in the academic libraries for 15 years at the University of Cincinnati and Tulane University. Era's research on archives and climate change has been profiled by Yale Climate Connections, Vice, and Pacific Standard, and has been honored by the Society of American Archivists. Her most recent publication is The Green New Deal for Archives. Brian Whitledge is the Public Services Librarian at the Clark Histor Historical Library at Central Mis Michigan University. He holds an MA in Political Science and an MLS. He serves as a member of the Society of American Archivists Committee on Public Policy and is SAA's liaison to the National Coalition for History, the premier advocacy organization for history, archives, and related fields. So again, what was mentioned earlier, we'll take questions after. Please post them in the chat and, and then we'll have the survey at the end too. Okay, I turn it over to the speakers. Everybody, um, my name is Colette McDonough and um, I'm the exiting chair for the Society of Ohio Archivists and, uh, well, sorry, the so so Advocacy and Outreach Committee. And um, I'm excited for all, you, for all of us to be here. Um, last year, many of you heard me speak on self-advocacy. Um, this time we're going to focus on more of a, uh, regular advocacy, um, and specifically speaking on the session, well, the event at SAA last year called Archives on the Hill. This event has taken place twice. Uh, and... Uh, the first one being in 2018, and most recently in 2013, 2023, the event was co-sponsored by the Society of American Archivists and the Council of State Archivists. Uh, it is a day of advocacy of uh, with legislative policymakers. Both Brian and I have taken place taken part in this twice. Uh, Brian being more involved in it than myself. This is a great event. Uh, especially if you're wanting to get your uh, put your toes in advocacy, uh, since it is so well planned, uh, you are provided with the research and resources that you might need, and of course you can do your own little homework. Uh, this training uh, includes major talking points, and it's extremely helpful, since especially for me, I'm not always up on all the federal issues. And before the actual event, uh, you get to strategize and chat with your uh, colleagues. All the talks with senators and representatives are planned ahead of time. And the hardest part is, frankly, finding your way around D.C. So let's get started with hearing from Ira in her video. And Colette, did you want to play that or did you want me to do Go ahead, Brian. Okay, perfect. I'll get that here in okay. <laughs> 10 seconds. I'll get that here in okay. <laughs> 10 seconds. Hi, everyone. I am sorry that I can't be there with you today during the conference, but I was glad to contribute some of my thoughts on Archives on the Hill and how important it is for archivists to get involved with advocacy. My name is Ara Tanzi and I'm an archivist based here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I used to work for the University of Cincinnati, but now I have my own business called Memory Rising. Last year, I was so happy to join uh, the Society of American Archivists, 
our Guide to Sound the Hill event. And you've probably already heard a little bit about this from earlier in the presentation. But my experience joining Archives on the Hill was the first time I had done it. And so I was really pleased to see how people were trained and how much it also built on my prior interest in archives and public policy. When I did Archives on the Hill, I was part of a group that met with both Senator Sherrod Brown and Senator J.D. Vance. And I should specify and say not with the senator specifically, but with their staff members. Um, for those of you who have not done legislative advocacy before, um, the uh, elected officials are usually pretty, pretty busy individuals. So you will often meet with a staff member and the staff members of who you meet with will often run the gamut in terms of their level of knowledge. So when I met with um, Sherrod Brown's staff, and again, I was with a team, but Sherrod Brown's staff were very, very knowledgeable about many archives issues and also about the funding agencies that archives often interact with. Um, there is a member of Sherrod Brown's staff whose uh, portfolio actually includes education and culture issues. So that's great news if you're an archivist and ever does advocacy work um, with Sherrod Brown's office. On the other hand, given that um, Senator J.D. Vance was elected fairly recently, when we met with his staff member, they were clearly still getting up to speed, um, and the staff member did not know as much about archives issues or about education and culture funding. So when you uh, do archives on the Hill, one of the things that you learn how to do is you get training to talk about archives in very quick and relevant ways. Um, and so, for example, when I talk about archives and how important they are to people who might not know what archives are, I always talk about if you visit Washington, D.C. and you go to see the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, where do you go? You go to the National Archives. So when I'm talking with non-archivists about the importance of archives, I would use that example. And it's great to go into something like Archives on the Hill, thinking about similar examples you can convey to um, staff members that you might meet with. So you might talk about the importance of things like veteran service records, right? Veteran service records are very important uh, for veterans to be able to receive the benefits um, that, that they are entitled to from their service uh, period. Having those stories in mind, um, not just at that kind of larger general level, but also how they are specific to that senator's interests or to the institution that you have worked with um, can be really powerful. So when we went to visit Sherrod Brown's office, one of the things that is very common to senators' offices is that they'll have a lot of stuff that kind of reflects their own interests or maybe um, the history or culture of their state. So when we visited Sherrod Brown's office, I noticed that he had a big display case full of United Mine Workers of America paraphernalia. And um, the United Mine Workers of America were uh, a very powerful union. And of course, those of you who know about Sherrod Brown's interests know that he has been a strong advocate for the labor movement. I also happen to have um, some own um, some of my own interests and, and roots in the labor movement. And my archive that I had previously worked at, um, the University of Cincinnati, had been part of something called the Ohio Labor History Project. And that Ohio Labor History Project um, was a project of the 70s and 80s, but its legacy still shades off because a lot of universities around the state of Ohio have these amazing labor union collections. So I thought, ah, that would be something that would resonate with his staff. It's talking about, um, you know, the Ohio Labor History Project. And indeed, um, there's a lot of United Mine Workers of America records at Ohio University due to the Ohio Labor History Project. So I was able just to sort of draw on that knowledge on the fly in that meeting with Sherrod Brown's staff. And I think that um, kind of impressed them. So when you do advocacy, it's really important to think about not just sort of these general issues of why archives are important to society, but things that will resonate with that elected official's interest. And also personal stories that you can bring from some of the work that your institution has done that might resonate um, with the elected official and their staff. 
So I was part of this sort of delegation that advocated with Senator Sherrod Brown and Senator J.D. Vance's staff. But the advocacy doesn't stop there. Um, during that event, Archives on the Hill, a friend of mine who is a constituent of Massachusetts advocated with Senator Ed Markey's office. And Senator Ed Markey is one of the co-sponsors of the Green New Deal resolution. And um, one of the one of the publications I wrote in, within the last couple of years is called A Green New Deal for Archives. And that talks all about the importance of archives and climate change and public policy. And so when that friend was doing her archives on the Hill uh, advocacy visit with Senator Ed Markey, she mentioned, oh, by the way, my friend Era has done uh, this thing around Green New Deal and archives. Would you ever want to talk with her? To our collective surprise, the staff were like, yeah, we do want to talk with her. So then I got to have another advocacy visit, even though it wasn't really my elected representative. But Senator Ed Markey's staff were really interested in this idea. So I had this really amazing phone call, uh, Zoom call with them. It turned out that one of uh, Markey's staff members, her mother was an archivist, so just really cool connections. And you just never know when you're doing these types of advocacy visits, when you're out there with all of these other archivists, what kind of really important connections um, you can make there. So I want to stress this idea that advocacy is not just something that you might do with your elected official, but there are ways that you can kind of bring your own interests and your own passions uh, to other to other uh, other elected officials who, who might be informed by your perspectives. Finally, there's something I want to say about sort of the importance of this advocacy work for those of us in the state of Ohio. We know that there have been a number of bills cropping up in the state legislature over the last few years that really are troubling in terms of what they portend for teaching um, a really transparent and honest picture of some of the more difficult aspects of our collective history. We saw this with SB83, which was a bill um, that is sort of still living on in a zombie form. Um, every time parts of it get taken out, they come back in another bill somewhere. But SB83 was one of these bills that tried to basically put um, a lot of restrictions around the ways that certain forms of history could be taught in our institutions of higher education. And one of the things that SB 83 also did was it tried to talk about the types of acceptable primary source documents that could be taught. Now, our alarm bells should be going off as archivists when we see language like that. So where Archives on the Hill comes into this is that it is also about the idea of really putting our advocacy skills through the training, um, like through a, through a marathon session of training, right? Um, and also normalizing the idea that advocacy is something that we don't just do every four years when SAA goes to Washington, D.C., but there are ways that we can do advocacy now, right? In our, in our own cities, in our own states, um, and that we should be doing that. I think that advocacy is one of the most important skills that archivists can have. Um, we know that we depend on the relationships we have with our allies, right, with historians and genealogists and journalists, but no one can advocate for archives quite like archivists themselves. And we have to learn these advocacy skills because um, no one is coming to save us. <laughs> we have to, we really have to be fierce advocates um, for, for our institutions, for grant funding, for all of the sources of support that we know archives need to remain successful uh, into the future. And keeping an eye on some of this uh, legislation that is continuing to crop up in our state legislature, I think is a really, there, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And I hope that uh, thinking about advocacy might help us figure out how within the context of Society of Ohio Archivists, we might be able to start doing more advocacy at the state level. I'll leave it there because I know that there are other panelists on um, on today's panel that have a lot to share with you. And I'm so sorry that I can't be there um, live uh, in person to join all of you, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
um, feel free to email me hello at memoryrising.net and um, I'd love to keep this advocacy conversation going because it is fun too. It's really fun to talk about why archives matter. It's not scary. It's, it's a really fun skill set to develop. So I hope I'll see you out there advocating somewhere in a state house, somewhere uh, in the state capitol, somewhere um, in our nation's legislature capital at some point in the future. So that was Era speaking about uh, uh, her experience. Um, Colette, did you want to speak about yours or would you like me to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of what we did? Brian, I do believe that you are up next. Okay, great. Um, so I'll get the slides here in a second. Uh, so uh, my name is Brian Whitledge and um, I uh, do a lot of work with advocacy for the Society of American Archivists. And actually, I got introduced to all this legislative advocacy stuff. I have an interest in public policy, um, just innate. And um, I got interested in it when I was uh, doing Archives on the Hill. Um, back in uh, 2018, I got invited to go and it was a wonderful experience. Um, so that is how I uh, got involved. And hopefully we can all see the screen here. And if not, I'm, I'm trusting that somebody will let me know. Um, so Archives on the Hill, the second iteration, we're having the meeting in Washington, D.C. in uh, 2023, and a couple of us who work with um, the public policy, uh, the intersection of public policy and archives policy for SAA said we want to do this again, and we partnered with our, our, our colleagues from COSA and also a little bit with the National Association of Government Archives and Records Administrators, NAGARA to put this on um, and it's quite uh, uh, the event. So um, these are a few pictures from what we had done. Uh, uh, this is um, on the right, you'll see the training session. So one thing that was mentioned was the training. Um, bringing people together to give you a little bit of how it's gonna go is really uh, important. If um, from somebody who participated the first time you're going to Washington DC, or let's say you're going to Columbus for a, a statewide uh, event, it's somewhat nerve wracking. And so to be in the room with uh, some people who know what they're doing, but also somebody who can tell you exactly what's going on. Uh, for our training this year, we didn't do any role play, but sometimes it's helpful to do like a role play if you've never done it before, where somebody is the legislator and somebody isn't. Um, most of the time you don't meet with a legislator at the national federal level. Oftentimes at the state level, you do um, definitely with the local level, you meet with your policymakers. Um, and so it's really helpful to uh, play that out if you need to. Uh, if not, you'll get the hang of it, especially if you have somebody with you who's done it before. On the left, um, this was my colleagues, and we're going to talk, Era brought up something that I, I'm going to touch on, but um, this is us waiting to get onto the Senate subway. Uh, if you know if you know the ins and outs, you can get onto the Senate subway uh, by, by making a polite request. Um, and there's my group again on the right. And um, on the left is uh, kind of what my big point will be uh, here in a moment. Um, and that's uh, Alex Klein from the National Humanities Alliance. And I'll talk about Alex in a second. So for me and my group, um, we were paired up. We were Maine and uh, Michigan. And the reason that we were paired up is that there was only one person from Maine and there were two from Michigan. Uh, for Ohio, luckily, everybody had a, a big group so we could have an Ohio group. But for this case, um, we had we paired us up. The um, Kate McBrien, the state archivist of Maine, was unable to. Uh, or this was her first time doing this, so we paired her up with somebody who was experienced, which was me, and it made a group. So that gave us multiple meetings. That gave everybody a little bit of a chance. We could go into a Michigan meeting, and then Kate could see that, and then she could be the lead for the Maine meeting. And so Era's point when she was speaking about meeting with um, Senator Markey's office is really important. Take as many opportunities as you can. Pair up with somebody who's done it before, even if you're not the constituent. Um, sometimes you might have some information to bring. Uh, you might be the numbers person, right? You've got the stats. You can say, well, this year, the re request for the federal budget for the National Archives is, uh, I think it's $438 million this year, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, you can give those kind of numbers. 
you're not the constituent. The constituent's the one that really hammers home the message, um, makes it meaningful to the district, to the senator. Um, but you can always be there in support, and that's completely fine. And so it's a really good way of getting some experience if you need some, pairing up with somebody who's done it. But it's also um, a helpful way to kind of approach it from different angles. Uh, I'm quite gregarious and chatty, and that's really good. Uh, in some cases, and sometimes it needs to be toned down and I need somebody else to come along to maybe um, help uh, bring the tone um, to, to something maybe a little less, uh, a little less gregarious. So those are always good things to have multiple people with you and pair up. Do not feel like you have to go it alone. Um, so in one of our meetings, we had an excellent talk. The topic, usually the topic when we talk about archives advocacy or humanities advocacy is going to be funding because we know that resources are what are, are lacking. And so um, I happen to have a group that we got to meet with somebody who was involved with the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, which is the uh, oversight committee for the Senate over the National Archives Policy, Federal Records Act. Presidential Records Act. And we had a very wonderful conversation about Presidential Records Act reform. Um, luckily, I, I felt comfortable with that topic being around it enough. Um, but that was very unusual to have a meeting like that that was policy focused. Most most talks are going to be about funding. And um, the policy stuff is really uh, esoteric and niche. And you know, there's maybe 12, 15,000 archivists in the country. And how many people know what the Federal Records Act, all the nuance of it? I'm um, certainly not legislative staffers who are 26 years old, 30 years old, um, dealing with constituent requests on uh, a myriad of, of topics. Uh, Federal Records Act is not at the top of their, their policy agenda. But Emily from uh, Senator Peter's office in Michigan uh, is well-versed in federal, Rec federal Records Act. So we had a great conversation and we went with it. Um, every other conversation was about needing more money, which is good too. And in general, the conversation really centers on making a connection. Um, if you go and make the connection one time, if I went to Emily's office in Senator Peters' uh, staff one time and left it there, that would be it. But I've had the opportunity to email Emily on a couple more occasions. Uh, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. for another um, program um, earlier this year. And I called up Emily and said, hey, can I swing by your office? And she said, absolutely. So keeping that relationship going, I Emily now knows me as an archivist and she and I know her as a federal records policy person. So if I have somebody within SAA who says, we need to talk about the Federal Records Act. I have an in to somebody. And if she says we need an archivist, she can give me a call. And I'm not the right archivist to do to offer what she needs. Um, but I do know people who are the right archivist. Uh, and so that's that's a really helpful thing to do. It's building a relationship. It's constantly keeping it going. Even if all it is is saying October is American Archives Month. I don't know if you saw this news release. It might interest the senator or it might interest the rep or it might interest the mayor. Um, so those are usually helpful. Uh, so getting back to this picture of Alex and me, um, archives is a small niche. It really is a small profession, but it has so much huge impact. Um, Era had said, find something that resonates with the staffers. And she mentioned the Charters of Freedom. Uh, I always like to point to Henry Louis Gates' show on PBS, um, uh, Knowing Your Roots, because a lot of people have seen that. And anytime somebody says, oh, you guys are like Henry Louis Gates, I say, yes, exactly. And we all know as archivists, no, we're doing so much different stuff. And, and But if that's what connects and if they have good feelings about that show, then that's what I want to latch on to, those good feelings. Um, yeah, we're there to find information. We're there to steward it. We're there to protect it and keep it available for the next generation. Um, so Alex, working for the National Humanities Alliance, does this a lot with other uh uh, efforts. And uh, if it weren't for Alex, we couldn't have pulled off Archives on the Hill the way we did. She helped us with our training. Uh, she made sure that we had a connection so that we could get a room in the Rayburn House office building for training. And she really helped us set up the organization of uh, doing scheduling. We had our own scheduler, but she gave us some tips. Um, and so it's not that archivists need to rely on others. We really need, need to do this ourselves. But we need to have partners who we can call on because 
40 archivists, as Ara says, going to, to, to Washington, D.C. once every four years isn't going to move the needle at all. So when we can get the history folks to say, well, this is what the archivists need, too. And when we can get the humanities folks to say, this is what archivists need as well. That really pushes our message a little bit further. Um, so those are some of the big things. The last takeaway I'll leave you with is we're all doing this to make the profession stronger and better. But being a little self-serving is um, OK. It's not sleazy at all to talk to politicians. I did a Michigan Advocacy Day for libraries here earlier this month, and one of my colleagues said, this just feels so sleazy. And all I could think is, no, it doesn't. This feels like I'm speaking to somebody who works for me, telling them what I need, my legislator, and I am trying to get on their priority. And I'm not doing anything wrong um, by doing that. Uh, it's not dirty. It's not bad. It's not most public policy and politics is really not all that awful. It's not what we see in the news all the, all the time. Um, so as much as we're doing this better the profession, it's okay to be somewhat self-serving. So Era mentioned she really has a thing about uh, climate change and, and a possible Green New Deal for archives. She's going to put that out there despite the fact that she's also going to say, can we have more money for the National Endowment for the Humanities programs and preservation? Uh, I happen to be in a situation where my institution applied for an earmark uh, in the federal budget one year. And I could call up my contact, who the person in whose office I met with um, several times, and say, hey, we just put in an earmark. Would you take a look for that? And and that's that's OK. I made a relationship that I could use. I'm not doing it solely for myself. An opportunity presented it and I could make the most of it. And so don't ever feel bad about doing that. Don't go in with a self-serving mindset, but also take advantage of the opportunities that come your way that way. So with that, I will leave it to Colette, who will speak about the Ohio group's experience. Hey, everybody. Um. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge all the hard work that went into planning Archives on the Hill and, frankly, this conference, because I have been there and I know how much work it takes to make these happen. Uh, so thanks for all of your hard work for making these events happen. The 2023 Archives on the Hill event went fairly well for me. I was able to meet with the offices of Senators Brown, Vance, and even Cruz group members was from Texas. I didn't have much of a uh, play in that one. I was just there. I was just cheering her on. Uh, plus, uh, Representative Mike Turner's office. Uh, each of these meetings went differently, but our group handled them professionally. And uh, Ohio had an excellent team of uh, people who were advo advocating for uh, archives. Our group included the fantastic Dan Noonan, who couldn't be here today because he is on vacation. Lucky dog. Uh, and then also Ira and myself and the lovely uh, Lauren Goodley from Texas, which you can see Lauren here, and she's outside of Ted Cruz's office. Uh, so myself, Ira, and Dan. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. since Brian was from the state up north, he was in another group. Uh, so we can't hold that against him, too, right? And uh, so we've heard a little bit about meeting with senators. So I thought I would focus on my meeting with uh, one of our representatives. I live in the Dayton area, uh, which is uh, makes sense for me to be the point person for uh a meeting with Mike, Representative Mike Turner. This was not my first time meeting with Mike Turner's office. Uh, the, and frankly, this one didn't go as well as we were hoping. And that's just part of the, that's just part of advocacy work. There we go. Um, the first clue was the uh, person didn't even have us meet in the office. They just kind of swept us off to the side in a hallway. Uh, the gentleman barely allowed us to introduce ourselves and uh, seemed to be in his own universe when we did get to talk to him. Uh, Dan and myself were barely able to discuss uh, the American 250 Caucus and the federal grants that Archives in Dayton had received. Uh, we could tell that he was very, very busy and 
what should have been a 15 minute meeting turned out to only be five. Uh, but when I, I met with his office in 2018, I met with two different people. Uh, it was a lovely meeting. We sat down, we had a great conversation. They were aware of the importance of archives. I believe one of their moms was a librarian or archivist. So yay. Um, and I was able to be in touch with them for uh, like a, a, a year or two until they moved on to another part. I'm sure they got a job in the Senate or something like that. Um, Turner is known for his love of history. So I think we just caught his office on a bad day um, this time around. So one of the tasks we were supposed to be uh, mentioning at each of our meetings was the America 250 cau caucus. And Ohio, sorry guys, this is Milo. Say hi, Milo. Bye, Milo. Uh, <laughs> no. Of course, as soon as I start talking, that's when he comes up. Uh, oh, at the time, Amer uh, Ohio didn't have a uh, person in the America 250 caucus. The caucus serves as a resource for lawmakers and their congressional staff. Uh, who are interested in being a part of the American 250 effort. This is something that we brought up at each one of our meetings. And um, Senator Brown's office really didn't seem to be interested. His person said that we were, uh, they were very busy with the Veteran Affairs Committee, which that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, we were not expecting everybody was like, yeah, let's do this. Um, during our meeting with Senator Vance's office, they actually did seem very interested. Uh, but since he was a brand new senator at the time, um, he had a lot on his plate and I guess he didn't have time, which is fine. Uh, thankfully, Ohio does have a representative on there uh, with Representative Bob Latta from Bowling Green, but we had nothing to do with that. We were also focusing on the robust funding. Oh. Ah, what's going on? Uh, we're, we're focusing on the robust funding and support for programs that support archives like NARA, IMLS, and various others. This is when doing your homework uh, is really important uh, for senators and representatives. For instance, if the College they attended uh, received a grant from uh, one of these ins uh, this institutions. It'd be a good idea to bring up that specific grant and how it affected their alma mater. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, doing your homework is a key part of advocacy. Um, so how you tailor your talking point? How do you tailor your talking points to them? First, you know, you've got the internet, you can do that. Um, and then uh, you can also use the decor in their office to be able to strike up a conversation. Uh, Iris, like she said, saw multiple fo photos of mine workers and since she was able to strike up a conversation about uh, mine workers. At the uh, 2018 meeting, my colleague was able to, who's not from Ohio, uh, did her homework by following Senator Portman on social media, on uh, Twitter. And so she was able to use that as a way to bring up conversations in our meeting that we had uh, uh, on Archives on the Hill. So it can never hurt to do your homework. Uh, you also need to be very flexible because you're not always going to be in the driver's seat. So it really depends on the person that you're meeting with and what they want to talk about. Uh, but you can help guide the, uh, the conversation uh, into a different direction. Another key part of it is follow-up. 
in 2018, I sent out four emails and got two responses. So that's not bad. Last year, I got sent out five emails to people that we met with, and I got one response. So not everybody's going to be able to get back to you. Uh, not everybody is going to have archives as their top priority, and that is okay. Uh, that's just a part of life. Uh, expecting everyone to feel as wonderfully about archives as we do, it's just not uh, realistic. But you have to focus on the ones that you do actually get in contact with that respond back to you. Focus on the wins. Something I struggle with in doing advocacy work is the fact that I have anxiety uh, and I'm not the most social person uh, with strangers. Uh, but since I work for a nonprofit that does not take any uh, government money, uh, they support me in doing this type of work uh, because we don't have uh, anything in the game. If, you know, but I'm out there trying to do my best for archives and for archivists. It is kind of, it is my duty to go out there and do the best for my field, especially since there's a lot of people out there who feel they cannot advocate for our field because they are, they worry about if they go out and, you know, ask for money that they'll get you know uh fired which i don't think is you know going to happen but they probably feel that way uh they don't want to ask they don't want to do that so they're like no 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 I i'm just going to hang out here and just have my little job uh do, 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 do. but there's a lot of people out there who can do this work who have the ability to go out there and talk to strangers and talk with all these people on the hill. Uh, I really don't feel like I'm one of them, but I've done it anyway. Uh, but doing this advocacy work makes me think of the quote by Alice Walker, the well-known author and uh, advocate for women's and civil rights movement. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. So I hope our session uh, helps you feel that you can do this kind of work because we're not special. Uh, we've just gone out there and done it. Uh, so we are hope we hope that you are the ones that we have been waiting for. And now is the time for the questions that we have for you all. So anybody feel free to uh, chime in and you don't you know you don't have to answer number one first. just go in with the, you know if you want to say get a You know, we're going to have a conversation. So if anybody would like to talk, it's okay too. So, and then those, for those who aren't looking at the screen, just so you know what your questions are, um, what kind of advocacy do you think SOA should do, engage it? How could SOA make it easier for you to do the advocacy work? Um, we all know everybody is busy. Everybody has a lot of things going on. Um, as Colette mentioned, there this is anxiety inducing sometimes to have to meet with people. What can SOA do to, to make you seize that opportunity uh, with, with the lowest barriers? Um, do you think SOA and other cultural heritage groups should work together on advocacy? And uh, why don't you think more do advocacy work? Um, we didn't give the numbers, but there were only there were about 40 of us in Washington, D.C. for um, Archives on the Hill. Uh, we did it uh, two days ahead of the SAA uh, conference. And so um, for some people, that would be the cost incurred, right? If you're going to Washington, D.C., now you have to spend an extra day in the hotel, maybe two to get there. Um, so we saw 40 out of 2,500, well, 2,200 people who attended the conference uh, were there. So things like that to keep in mind. <clears throat> and Nicole wrote for The Barrier, um, some people don't know how to get started and they may not have time or resources to figure it out. So that's The Barrier. Just even getting the, the, the I'm going to be from Michigan and use a automotive metaphor, getting the engine cranked. Uh, can't even do that. 
Well, well thankfully, we don't have to crank engines anymore because Charles F. Kettering, where I work, I work for the Charles F. Kettering Company, invented the uh, electronic starter. So you're welcome. You don't have to get it cranking anymore. You can just turn the key. 